John or Juan, is it working? I cannot hear anyone, so. OK, I think I see at least a signal. Yeah, I, yeah, I can hear you now, yes. It's working, yeah, it's working fine. OK, great. Yeah, can you turn off the waiting room also? Turn off Zoom? the what? The waiting room in Zoom, because oh, okay. I otherwise I need to admit everyone one by one, which is a bit annoying. It interferes with the presentation. OK, maybe we should get started. Uh, we're on time. Yeah, I can. I can see people in the room also, and I think people in the room can see me, right? Everybody, can you hear me very well? Yes. Okay, great. Excellent. I, I see hands up, thumbs up, so that's great. Yeah, unfortunately, we'll have to do it th this way this week because I'm still under the weather, and you can probably tell from my voice that it's not perfectly like 100% yet, or maybe not even 80% yet, but uh, I still want to lecture, so we'll have to do it in a hybrid mode uh, today. Uh, so let me change the screen over here so that I can uh, see uh, people when I watch. I know you spotlighted me, but I would prefer seeing. Okay. That's not going to be easy, I guess. Okay, anyway. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get started uh, without further uh, delay. So I'm hoping I'll recover tomorrow, but I don't know yet. Let's, let's see. It's good to see many of you in the room, though. So today, we're going to uh, raise the abstraction level uh, a little bit. So far, we've been talking about digital design in this course. Uh, now, we've built up enough basics so that we can actually talk about instruction set architectures and microarchitectures. So the remaining part of this course is going to be on uh, these topics, essentially. Uh, and uh, these are just reminders that you know of. So hopefully you're doing the additional assignments. So this is what we have learned so far. Basically, we have covered a lot of basics, uh, digital design, and we're mostly done with the digital design part of this course, which is this area over here. And today we're going to move to uh, the higher level uh, area over here, which essentially covers software hardware interface and the microarchitecture. Uh, Give me a second. This actually needs to be, I think, both lectures will cover most of microarchitectures. So I'll, I'll fix that also. So what we will learn today is a basic processing model of computers, von Neumann model, and look at LC3 and MIPS instruction set architectures, define what an instruction set architecture is. It's the vocabulary of a computer. And look at examples of how these instruction set architectures operate and how we can interface with the computer basically from the software level. And then tomorrow, we will look at assembly and programming a little bit. So it's a, it's a form of programming, but it's doing an assembly. And uh, we will uh, inadvertently have to cover some microarchitecture because ISA, uh, microarchitecture is really the implementation of this interface, the uh, instructions. Uh, but uh, really, we will go into microarchitecture next week, uh, cover different styles of microarchitectures, and we'll build up to modern processors uh, in, in several lectures, actually. So it's going to be quite exciting. Uh, so, as I mentioned today, uh, we're going to talk a lot about the basic model, instruction set architecture, look at different types of instructions, operate, data, movement, and control. We're going to look at instruction formats, how they get executed, and addressing modes. And I expect this to span today and tomorrow, and tomorrow we will also look at uh, assembly programming. Does that sound good? Okay, great. Okay. Okay, so readings. Uh, basically, uh, these are some readings that I uh, suggest over here. But what I will follow today uh, and tomorrow is uh, Pat and Patel, chapters four, five, and six. Uh, I think they, uh, it nicely outlines uh, von Neumann model, ISA, uh, and programming. But uh, there's a different treatment of it in uh, Harris and Harris. If you read either of them, it's fine. If you read none of them, as long as you understand what I say, uh, there's no problem, actually. And next week, there are some readings on microarchitectures, as you can see over here. So we've been talking about building a computing system, and uh, that's what brings us to the von Neumann model today, because any computing system that you need to build needs to have some sort of model. We call this, we, we looked at this picture uh, early on in the past is, uh, we looked at what is a computer, right? A computer consists of processing, memory, and I.O. Now we're going to actually delve deeper into it. I said we'll cover all components, and today we'll cover the basic processing model of modern general purpose computers. Uh, 
So let's build up to a basic computing model. Uh, clearly, we covered combination logic and sequential logic. With these logic structures, now we can build a lot of things, execution units, decision units, memory and storage units, and communication units. And we've actually shown how we build a lot of these. Uh, and you've seen a lot of examples in Verilog also how to build these. And all, all of these are actually the basic elements of a computer. Now, we've raised our abstraction level and go to the software, hardware interface, and microarchitecture and use these logic structures to construct a basic computer model. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, what we want to do with computers before we uh, create that basic model. Clearly, to get a task done by a general purpose computer, uh, in, the, in this lecture, uh, the focus will be on general purpose computers. It's not going to be on accelerators or FPGAs that may be specialized, uh, that may be reconfigurable, that may not require some sort of ISA, at least directly. Our, our focus is on general purpose computers to begin with. Later, we will talk about other types of systems that, for example, Get, can get programmed using data flow. FPGAs actually are a good fit for data flow. But today, think about general purpose systems, Intel, AMD, Apple systems that are built uh, today. So to get a task done, uh, we need a computer program clearly. That program needs to execute. And uh, a program is essentially uh, uh, a list of instructions that specifies what the computer must do. Right? And the computer itself, of course. Right? The computer carries out the specified task by the program. And clearly, program is written based on an algorithm and that's the uh, transformation hierarchy, levels of transformation we have discussed. Right? Okay, what is a program? As I just said, actually, it's a set of instructions. So these are uh, program consists of a set of instructions, right? Each instruction specifies a well-defined piece of work for the computer to carry out. So this is really the agreement between the programmer and the hardware. Programmer expects that a given instruction behaves in such a way it produces a semantic result uh, based on the contract between the programmer and the hardware. This is called the instruction set architecture, essentially. Hardware software interface or hardware software contract, in other words. An instruction is the smallest piece of work specified in a program that you cannot specify anything uh, smaller than the granularity of an instruction. Hopefully this is obvious and we will see that uh, when we see programs. What is an instruction set? Instruction set is essentially all possible instructions that a computer is designed to be able to carry out. And essentially a computer promises the programmer that they can use and the computer is able to carry it out. That's the instruction set or ISA, instruction set architecture. Okay, so with this in mind, let's talk about what one Neumann model is. So in order to build a computer, normally you, you, need a, you need an execution model for processing computer programs. Okay, you have this program and you have the set of instructions, but how are you going to process them, right? That's the question basically. And we will see other processing models later on in this course, but we'll start with the von Neumann model because it's really the basic processing model that has been extremely successful for more than 75 years uh, today. And this is proposed by John von Neumann. Hopefully many of you know who that is. He's uh, a pioneer of computing clearly and computer architecture. He proposed a fundamental model in 1946, and this is him. Uh, and this is the paper where he proposed along with his colleagues this fundamental model. And this fundamental model consists of five components essentially of a computer. We're, we're gonna cover each of them in detail a little bit more detail clearly. Memory stores the program and the data. There's a processing unit that processes the instructions. There's an input, output, and control unit, which controls the order in which instructions are carried out. Okay, and throughout this lecture, we'll examine two examples of the von Neumann model, LC3, MIPS. But keep in mind that all general purpose computers today actually use the von Neumann model. This model has been so successful because it's extremely simple and very easy to reason about and very easy to debug. Is that essentially all general purpose computers today are built using this model. We will see alternative models uh, that uh, are alternatives, like data flow, for example, is a complete alternative to von Neumann model in lecture, uh, in, in, in lecture 11 or so. Uh, and, and we'll talk about, for example, other things later on also, uh, like single instruction, multiple data. But even though uh, some, some of the models are still based on von Neumann, if you, if, if, for example, GPUs have a different model uh, that, um, that, that, that have a lot of parallelism, but a lot of what they inherit is really from the von Neumann model as well in the end. So I keep that in mind. Okay, so this is a pictorial uh, depiction of the von Neumann model. And we're gonna cover these five components. Let's start with the first component, uh, memory. I mean, we're familiar with memory. Recall that this is a memory array. This is a very small memory array. We have four locations and each location contains three bits. Uh, and you need to have memory essentially so that you can store programs as well as data that the programs operate on. And uh, this is a toy memory, but modern memory is much larger as we discussed. So as I just said, memory is needed to store programs and data. And memory contains bits. 
uh, bits is a single digit, essentially, single binary digit, right? As we have seen, one or zero. And bits are logically grouped into bytes. Bytes are eight bits. And words. Words are essentially, the definition of a word is dependent on the computer. This is, uh, it could be eight, 16, or 32 bits. And this, uh, a word is essentially the length of uh, data that you operate on at once. So we will see that uh, specified more clearly when we talk about the processing unit. Processing unit is capable of operating on words and things that are potentially smaller than the granularity of words. For example, in MIPS, uh, a word is 32 bits. So when people talk about a 32 bit computer, that means that this computer can uh, add uh, 32 bits, okay? And memory can actually group these things into words as well. Okay, so uh, we've seen these definitions before actually when we talked about memory in lecture six, but uh, address space is a total number of uniquely identifiable locations in memory. And in LC3, the address space is two to the 16. Basically you have two to the 16 locations you have 16-bit addresses as a, as a result, because in order to address two to the 16 locations, you need to have 16-bit addresses. And remember, this is a decoder, right? It's a 16 to two to the 16 decoder. In MIPS, the address space is two to the 32. In more modern computers, like x 64 the address space is up to two to the 48. So you can have 48-bit addresses. So you can see that this is becoming larger and larger, and it's becoming even larger today, actually. Addressability is, and you've also seen addressability in lecture six, is how many bits are stored in each location? And these are specified by the uh, model, again, instruction set architecture. Basically, in each address, how many bits can we store? For example, 8-bit addressable means also byte addressable, says each location uh, contains one byte. And many computers today are byte addressable, actually. But not all computers today are byte addressable. Some of them are word addressable. Whenever you address a location, you get a word. It could be 32 bits, for example, in LC3. Uh, LC3 is actually word addressable, and you get 16 bits at a time whenever you access a memory location. Okay, so this is the programmer's view of memory, actually. Underlying view may be different. In the, in the hardware, in the memory controller, for example, uh, you can group bits in different ways as long as you ensure that the programmer sees an address space that you promise, as well as an addressability that you promise. Okay, so if there are questions, uh, so a given instruction can operate on a byte uh, or a word. By the way, I lost the camera feed uh, from the room, so I'm not seeing the uh, people who are watching. So I cannot see what's going on in their faces if they're raising hands or anything. So if someone can fix that, that'd be great. Uh, I will keep going in the meantime. But if there are questions, somehow uh, please coordinate with TAs in the room so that you can, I can try to answer them. So that's memory for you. Now let's take a look at an example memory, a simple uh, memory. This is again, representation from the programmer's point of view. Underlying implementation may be totally different. And we will see underlying implementations of memory Actually, you have seen an underlying implementation of memory, right? Uh, this is an underlying implementation, four by three locations. It looks clearly different from the programmer's view over here. Uh, but programmer's view uh, looks like this, basically. You have a representation of memory with eight locations, meaning that you have eight addresses, meaning that you have three bits per address, as you can see over here. And each location in this particular case contains eight bits, so one byte. So it's a byte addressable memory, as you can see over here. Uh, so address space is eight as you can see. And if you look at what values are stored in what address, uh, so let's take a look. Uh, I didn't uh, populate data values over here, over here, but I populated two examples over here. You can see that address, address four stores a value of six and address six stores a value of four. I mean, clearly it's, uh, this is very easy for you, hopefully at this point. Uh, okay, so one simple question maybe, how can we make same size memory bit addressable? So in this case, we have 64 bits in memory, right? You have eight locations. Uh, each location stores eight bits. So we have 64 bits. How can we make the same size memory bit addressable? It's very easy, basically. Each location contains one bit and you have 64 locations. That's the idea. Uh, so programmers view will be different. I don't have a picture for it. Sorry, this went too fast. So basically you have 64 locations and each location stores one bit. As a result, your address is six bits in the end because you have 64 locations, okay. So hopefully this is simple. And then you know how to build this memory right now, actually. Uh, basically, if you want to build this, for example, eight entry, eight location memory, where each location stores eight bits, you have an address decoder, three to eight address decoder. Uh, and then uh, you have uh, in each location, in each word line, you have eight D flip-flops connected so to store eight bits, meaning one byte. And then you have a multiplexer at the end to, this, to choose which location you're reading from. Uh, in the end. So you, you, basically what I just did is really extend, I'm going back in slides, extend this 
to eight locations and eight bits each. So we know exactly how to build this memory uh, right now because we've, we've, we've covered things from the ground up. Okay, so let's talk about word addressable and byte addressable a little bit more. Uh, in word addressable memory, each uh, data word has a unique address. Uh, in MIPS, for example, if, if MIPS were word addressable, you would have a unique address for each 32-bit data word. In LC3, which is word addressable, a unique address, you will have a unique address for each 16-bit data word. So let's take a look at MIPS memory. Assume that MIPS is word addressable, which is not the case today. Uh, but uh, if, if, you, if it were word addressable, you would look at memory like this. One memory location has one word. Another memory location has a second word. Another memory location has a third word. Another memory location has word three, dot, dot, dot. And you keep doing this. Meaning that, and the word address associated with these words is zero, one, two, three. Makes sense, hopefully, right? So this is our word address. Uh, let's take a look at byte addressable memory. In this case, each byte is a unique address. So if you look at word addressable memory, each byte does not have a unique address, right? Whenever you have an address zero, address one, there is no fractional addresses in between. So bytes don't have addresses in this case. So you cannot address, a, at the programmer level, you cannot address bytes. You can do shifting and bit manipulation, and then you can operate on bytes, sure, but you cannot address bytes in memory directly. So each byte has a unique address in byte addressable memory. MIPS is actually byte addressable. What I showed you earlier was actually an imaginary MIPS. Uh, LC3B, which is an updated version of LC3, is also byte addressable. So LC3 is a little computer, which is an instructional uh, ISA that's used by Pat and Patel book. This is how I actually learned uh, about computing systems. It's actually a beautiful instruction set architecture, very similar to MIPS in some aspects, different from MIPS in some other aspects. So we will cover both LC3 and MIPS so that you can appreciate things. But uh, things evolve in ISA. So LC3 evolved so that you actually have a byte addressable version, which is LC3B. Okay, we'll talk more about that. But let's take a look at this byte addressable MIPS. So this is MIPS memory. I'm still keeping the word abstraction over here. Each word consists of four bytes. Remember, a word is 32 bits. Each byte is 8 bits. So each word consists of four bytes. So you have word 0 here, word 1 here, word 2 here, word 3 here. Now, I'm showing you the byte address of the word. This word starts at address 0. This word starts at address 4 because there are four bytes in the first word. The next word starts at address 8 because there are four bytes in the previous word, et cetera. Now you can see that I can address each individual byte over here. Uh, one byte is zero, uh, one byte's address is 0. The second byte's address is two, uh, 1. The third byte's address is two. The fourth byte address is three. Makes sense, right? Now the programmer can say, I'm going to load one byte from memory. And his, here is the address. OK, so this sounds good. But the programmer may still want to use words in, their, uh, in the way they lay out data in memory, because they may actually be operating on words. But sometimes they need bytes as well, right? Sometimes they need to change one byte of the word. Sometimes they need to, uh, to add two words together. So the programmer needs to have a mechanism to actually address every single byte while also ordering bytes in some way. Then the question becomes, of course, how are these four bytes ordered? So we have four bytes over here, uh, but how do we order them? How do we know which byte is actually address zero, which byte is address one, which byte is address two, which byte is address three? Word, uh, uh, when the programmer uses a word, some, some bytes are, uh, one byte is most, uh, most significant, another byte is least significant, right? But how do we assign addresses uh, to those bytes? In other words, which of the four bytes is most versus least significant? Now, this brings us to a convention, basically. I'll, I'll uh, stray a little bit and give you a, 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 an example from Gulliver's Travels. Probably many of you have read Gulliver's Travels uh, at some point in your lives. And if you remember in Gulliver's Travels, there is a, a section that talks about big Indians and little Indians. Big Indians are people uh, who broke their eggs in the, the la larger side of the egg, uh, bigger side of the egg. That's why it's called the big Indian, bigger end of the egg. And at some point, a king came and say, said they should actually start breaking their eggs uh, from the smaller uh, end of the egg. This is a little endian, as you can see. And people can use either convention, right? There's no right or wrong over here. This is really a convention. Uh, if you break your eggs on the right side, you're a big endian. If you break your eggs on the left side, you're a little endian. So how does this make sense uh, in this case? So computers are also similar. So there are some, there, because of convention, there are some computers that are big endian. There are some, little, uh, some computers that are little endian. This is specified in the instruction set architecture again. And this really specifies the ordering of bytes in a word. So this is, we're still byte addressable in this case. We just show the word address, as you can see, 048C. But how do we address the individual bytes in a word depends on whether we are big endian or little endian. So a big endian convention says that least significant byte is in the higher byte address. So you look at this. Uh, the most significant byte in the word is here. 
the least significant byte of the word is here at address three. And that's true for all of the words, as you can see over here. Least significant byte is in the higher address. Whereas if you look at the li little endian, least significant byte is in the lower byte address. You can see that it's here over here. It's three over here. Uh, so uh, MIPS and LC3 are actually little endian. And I actually like little endian a little bit better because you can see that 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, et cetera. It's kind of a nice continuum over here. Whereas here, it's not that uh, nice of a continuum, if you will. But maybe there's another way of laying out things that makes it nicer. So this is really just a convention. It doesn't really matter in the end, as long as you know which byte you're addressing and it's, as long as you know which address is dedicated to. So if, you're, if you know that your computer is little endian, you know that most significant bytes is always at the higher byte address and least significant byte is always at the lower byte address in a word. Uh, this, th but the qualified answer is this basically, it's really a convention, but when you actually need to communicate between a big endian system and a little endian system, you need to share or exchange data. You, so you need to write from memory of one system uh, to the memory of another system. And then you need to convert a big endian layout, data layout to a little endian data layout. So that you, and then you basically you need to swap uh, the most significant ordering uh, most significant, the least significant ordering, such that you obey the convention of the computer that you're transferring data into. So in general, this doesn't matter. When you're programming a single computer, it doesn't matter as long as you know whether your computer is little endian or big endian. But when you're communicating between two computers, if a little endian is communicating with big endian versus, or, or the other way around, you need to know this. Hopefully this makes sense. This is uh, just a convention. It's an unfortunate convention, but whenever people Whenever there are multiple ways of doing things, people come up with different ways of doing things, as you can see. For example, Spark ISA is big endian. There are not many ISAs. X86 is little endian. So many ISAs are actually little endian, uh, but some ISAs are big endian. OK, so let's take a look at how we access memory. There are actually two ways of accessing memory. Uh, we can read or load from memory location. And we've seen how to do that earlier. Now we're going to abstract it away a little bit. We can write or store data to a memory location as well. And normally, we use two registers to access memory. These are actually microarchitectural registers. They don't need to be visible to the programmer. And we will see that in the next lectures. These, are, these can be invisible to the programmer. Programmer doesn't need to know about them, but it's useful for us to introduce them because they're useful to access memory. So a memory address register stores the address of the memory. Memory data register, uh, address of the memory location that we're trying to access. Memory data register would store the data that we get out of that location or data that we write, want to write to that location. OK, so to read, what do we do? The, step, the first step is to load the memory address register with the address we wish to read from. And uh, hopefully, after some point, data in the corresponding location gets placed in the memory data register because it takes some time for the memory to bring the data after you apply the address to the decoder. Remember, memory consists of a decoder and memory array and multiplexers. And there's time on uh, when you, uh, from when you store the address to the address register, which is connected to the decoder which drives the word lines and which drives the maxus, and then the data gets slashed into the memory data register. So it can be done in one clock cycle, for example. It could be done in also multiple clock cycles. We will see that later. And so now you, uh, the, the, the timing and verification as well as sequential logic lectures may be uh, flashing in your head, right? This is how we actually read. Uh, write the address to the memory address register, wait for some time, and hopefully the data, data appears in the memory data register. Okay. So uh, all of the timing that we discussed applies here. So to write data into memory, we need to load the memory address register with the address and the memory data register with the data we wish to write to memory. And then activate a write-enable signal. So uh, remember that write-enable signal in the mem little memory we showed? You need that write-enable signal. So this write-enable signal signals the memory so that the memory writes the value in the memory data register to the address specified by the memory address register. Again, this takes some time. It's dependent on the delays in the memory logic, decoder delay, word line delay, uh, latch delay, as well as the uh, uh, multiplexer. Uh, well, in this case, multiplexer delay doesn't matter because we're writing to memory. Multiplexer delay doesn't matter. So it's really uh, uh, is the delay on writing into the D flip flops that we have seen. Okay, just to uh, remind you, this is what I'm talking about basically. The delay is from uh, memory. There, there would be a memory address register here feeding the address over here, and then there would be a memory data register at the bottom over here. And memory data register actually can, is, is connected also into the data inputs over here so that you can write uh, data. So a memory data register is connected to uh, read outputs here as well as the write inputs over here. Okay, 
So everything is actually uh, logical based on what we have seen uh, in uh, prior lectures. Okay, and that was memory. For now, uh, this is our abstraction of memory. We're gonna talk more about memory and other parts, uh, but let's move to processing units. So processing units is something uh, essentially that uh, the unit that performs the actual computations. Uh, and it can consist of many functional units or many ALUs essentially. Functional unit and ALU are usually used interchangeably. And we will start with a simple arithmetic logic unit, ALU, which you have actually also seen. And this ALU executes computation and logic operations. For example, in LC3, these are the computation and logic operations, add, and, and not. And there's also an XOR in LC3B. In MIPS, there are actually much more. The MIPS is a real ISA, so there's a lot more that is, gets specified. So you can see that uh, there's a multiply, there's a shift left logical, shift left, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, shift logical left, shift logical right, and set less than, for example. And then there's a NOR, as you can see over here. Okay, so, and then uh, there are real processors that have many, many of these uh, that you can, you can think of multiply, divide, uh, float, uh, floating point multiplication, square root operation, for example. And the ALU processes quantities that are referred to as words. So this is, when, when you talk about a 32-bit computer, for example, that's really what the ALU processes. In, uh, and this is called a word length, essentially. Word length in LC3 is 16 bits. Word length in MIPS is 32 bits. Okay. And so in some uh, processors today, word length is 64 bits. Now, this doesn't mean that ALU cannot process smaller quantities. ALU can also process 8 bits, for example, at a time. But we are talking about the maximum word length it can process. Maximum word length is 32 bits. It can basically take 32 bits of input and uh, two inputs, for example, and add them and uh, create a 32 bit of output in the end. But it can also process smaller quantities. Uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that as a given. Okay, recall that this was one example ALU we saw when, they, when we talk about the combinational logic lectures. This was a very simple ALU, somewhat a MIPS ALU. It contains some of the uh, functionalities uh, of MIPS, as you can see over here. And again, this is, a, this is the internal implementation of the ALU using combinational logic. We've seen this before, and you can read uh, chapter five of Harris and Harris to see more detail about this. Okay, in addition to the ALU, the processing unit needs to have fast temporary storage. So this is going to show you importance of memory. Processing unit has to have memory as well uh, because uh, memory, uh, the main memory itself that we talked about is very slow. As a result, it's almost always the case that a computer provides a small amount of storage very close to the arithmetic logic unit or functional units. The purpose is to store temporary values and quickly access them later because we don't want to go to memory every time uh, we actually need to... Uh, uh, operate on some data. Okay, uh, for example, if you want to cal calculate uh, this uh, expression, a plus b multiplied by c divided by d, the intermediate result of a plus b can be stored in temporary storage, right? You don't need to store it to memory and then read it back from memory using a load instruction because that would take too much time. And that's the idea of this temporary storage. As I just said, it's too slow to store each ALU result in memory and then retrieve it again for future use. Why? Because a memory access is much slower than addition, multiplication, or division. Think of uh, a multiplication, uh, an addition, for example, can take one clock cycle. Even with a very fast clock cycle today, we can make additions take only one clock cycle. Whereas a memory access can take hundreds of clock cycles, like 300, 400, 500, 600 clock cycles are very common. You're doing this addition very quickly, and then does it really make sense to store the data to memory and get it back? No, that's why we have this temporary storage of registers. Now, that's true for other intermediate results also, A plus B times C, that intermediate result can be stored in the registers. So this temporary storage is usually a set of registers. It's called a register file. And we've actually seen an example of register file before as well. I'm going to show you in a little bit. So if you look at a processing unit, it consists of ALUs and temporary storage called registers. It can be multiple ALUs. This is just one example over here. So basically, memory is large but slow. Registers in the processing unit ensure fast access to values that are to be processed in the ALU. Typically, one register contains one word, which is the same as word length, but it can also contain smaller uh, uh, lengths. For example, x86 has many different types of registers containing different lengths of uh, uh, data. But in the end, uh, you need to have registers with uh, a word length so that you can operate them in the ALU using that word length. So a register set or register file essentially is a set of registers that can be manipulated by instructions that are close to uh, the arithmetic logic units. For example, LC3 has eight general purpose registers. And these registers are visible to the programmer. So whenever the programmer programs, programmer says, 
load this value from memory to this register, and then add these two registers together, provide the result, uh, give me the result and put the result into register X, for example. We will see example instructions that do exactly this. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but this is to motivate you that programmer actually sees these registers and they can program in assembly programming, saying, uh, instructing the computer to do an addition using two registers and then store the result into another register. So how does the programmer do that? They need to specify the register number. For example, three-bit register number. If you have eight general purpose registers, you need a three-bit register number. Again, this is small specialized memory, basically. It's very similar to the memory that we have seen. You have eight locations, and each location has one word, OK? Register sizes, word length in LC3, which is 16 bits in LC3. So OK, now we can calculate the size of the register file in LC3. MIPS has 32 general purpose registers. MIPS is actually larger, as you can see. It's a real instruction set architecture. And you can see that it, uh, you can address those registers using a five-bit register number and code in the instruction, as we will see. And the register size is the same as the word length in this particular case. x86, for example, initially started with eight registers. I believe right now it has 32 registers, maybe even more, actually. Don't quote me on it, general purpose registers. Initially, it started with eight registers, but people found out that eight registers is not enough in real programs. So they actually increased the register file size over time as the instruction set architecture evolved. OK, recall that this is a register, actually. This is a four-bit register that I showed you earlier, four D flops connected in parallel. This is from the sequential logic lecture. And we denote the register like this, if you recall. And again, this is another uh, way of uh, denoting the register. OK, this is just to recall and make you recall that what, what we are talking about right now is actually everything that we have seen. We're just looking at an abstraction level a little bit higher so that we, the programmer can also see these and actually manipulate these using instructions. OK, this is another example. You can find this in uh, Patan Patel, third edition. OK, this is an example of the MIPS register file. So uh, again, I don't expect you to uh, see all of this clearly. You can see that there are 32 registers. And there's a convention that MIPS provides saying that, OK, register 0 is always 0 because er people need uh, value 0. So if you want to generate a value 0, you hardwired the register 0 to 0. You cannot write to it. You can always generate a 0 very quickly. And then you can see that there are other registers used for other purposes. And we will see these a little bit more tomorrow when we talk about assembly programming. But there's a convention on using the registers also. And this is specified in the MIPS uh, API, Application Programming Interface. It's not really part of the instructions at architecture, but because it's a convention. It's not necessary that you obey this convention completely. What is specified in the instructions at architecture is register 0. Register 0 is 0. If you write to it, your value will not get written because we hardwired it to 0. And the reason is zero is a very common value that's used in programs. So we want to provide this zero value very quickly to the programmer so that they can just use register zero. If they want to, uh, for example, initialize a variable to zero, uh, they can basically copy this register zero to register five and use register five for the variable, for example. OK, so we covered processing unit and memory. Let's cover input output very quickly. We will not spend a lot of time in input output uh, in this course, especially. If you really want to learn about input output, you should really take an embedded systems course because an embedded systems course, embedded microprocessor design course, for example, embedded systems are all about dealing with input output. They're all about dealing with the nature as well as uh, interfaces between humans and other things. And that's where input output gets covered a lot. Uh, your, your books actually cover it a little bit more than the, I will cover in the lecture. So if you're really interested in input output, you should, you should definitely take a look at your books, uh, but we will not have time to cover a lot of input output in this uh, course. But what is input output? Clearly, this uh, input and output enable information to get into and out of a computer. I'm not talking about memory right now. I'm talking about disks, for example. Uh, I'm talking about, for example, keyboard and monitor and display. So many devices can be used for input and output. They're called peripherals in general. You can see some input devices over here. Uh, clearly, today, we have many, many more input devices. It could be, for example, some brain-machine interface that you have. It could be some wearable device that you have actually uh, that gets connected to uh, a farther away computer. But you can see that there are many examples. In LC3, we consider keyboard and monitor. And I'm going to briefly talk about them in uh, future slides, but not go into a lot of detail. OK, that brings us to the control unit, which is really a core component of the von Neumann model. Because von Neumann model is really about actually controlling instruction execution in a very particular way. And that particular way is really sequential processing of instructions. You process one instruction at a time, and you cannot start the next instruction before you finish the previous instruction. And this is a very powerful model because it enables programmers to make sense out of what's going on in the computer. Right? The programmer exactly knows which instruction is being executed. And if this instruction gets executed, what the result should be. So it doesn't confuse the program. It's a very nice, clean programming model as well. 
So let's talk about what is inside that control unit box. You can think of the control unit as a, like a conductor of an orchestra, basically. Uh, it conducts a step-by-step -step process of executing every instruction in a program. Uh, basically, every instruction is uh, uh, controlled by this control unit. So if you will talk about the instruction cycle, it controls what's called an instruction cycle, uh, and you will see that. Uh, so there are two things it needs to keep track of. It keeps track of which instruction is being processed via an instruction register, which contains the instruction. It turns out this doesn't need to be exposed to the programmer. This, this can be microarchitectural, does not exposed to the programmer, basically. But this is needed so that you can make sure all of the other components in the processor actually do what the instruction specifies them to do. That's why we need an instruction register. When we fetch the instruction from memory, we actually put the instruction into the instruction register, and then that instruction register gets decoded, et cetera. We operate on that instruction register to figure out what, what we need to do in the computer to process that instruction. OK, but we also need to keep track of which instruction to process next via a program counter. This is called a program counter or instruction pointer. Essentially, it's another register that contains the address of the next instruction to process. Sometimes this is the current instruction to process, but you increment it after some point so that it becomes the address of the next instruction to process. So this is called the instruction point. I like the term instruction pointer better than a program counter uh, because you're really pointing to the memory location that contains the instruction that you're going to process next. And this is the sequential execution model now you can see. You have a program, you started a program counter or instruction pointer, and then you fetch that instruction, you execute that instruction, and then increment the program counter so that that points to the next program, uh, next instruction in the program, right? Okay, so hopefully this is clear. We have only two registers, but a lot of control associated uh, with how we actually handle the program counter as well as how we actually handle the instruction register. So a control unit is really what enables a computer to work in the end. So this brings me to programmer visible or architectural state. So there are some registers in the system that are visible to the programmer. There are some registers that are not visible to the programmer. And whenever you program, you do not see the invisible register. You cannot manipulate the invisible registers, but you can manipulate what's visible to the program. And this is really part of the hardware software interface. The hardware says, these are the things that you can manipulate. And I'm going to give you how you can manipulate them. And I'm going to obey that uh, contract uh, so that uh, whenever you do something that is basically part of the contract, you can manipulate this, re these registers. So memory clearly is part of the architectural state. You can load from memory location, store into a memory location. General purpose registers are part of the architectural state. There are some special purpose registers that may be part of the architectural state, some machine registers, for example, that determine the status of the machine. Uh, but uh, we will not talk about them right now. We may get to them later on. Uh, but the general purpose registers that we talked about earlier, MIPS register file, for example, is visible to the programmer. And program counter is also visible to the program. So programmer knows exactly which program counter uh, is, being, uh, is being fetched right now or executed right now. Okay, Instructions and programs essentially specify how to transform the values of the programmer visible state from one state to another state, depending on, uh, the, spec uh, depending on the contract hardware software interface. So what an instruction does is it basically has the state, uh, program visible state before the instruction, memory registers program counter. After the instruction, that state gets transformed to another state. Of course, not all, every single component of the state gets transformed. Some locations that are specified by the instruction get transformed. So that's the idea, basically. That's the beauty. So you can think, you can think of a machine as a finite state machine, basically. A finite state machine that contains all of these registers that are programmer visible. And an instruction, that instruction transforms states to the next state based on the specification of the instruction. So we will see this again. We will, we will talk about a basic computer as a finite state machine, and you will see that uh, that's how an instruction gets processed. But keep this in mind. But keep also in mind that there are some, some registers that are not visible to the programmer. For example, the instruction register. The programmer doesn't need to know about it. You could make it visible. You could, you could, you could put it in the hardware software contract saying that Programmer, I, I also have another register, instruction register, and here it is. You can manipulate it, but people don't do it because it's not really necessary in the end. Okay, we will see a lot more of this distinction later on. Okay, so now we've actually built the von Neumann model from the ground up. We actually talk about all five components. And if you really want to have a von Neumann machine, you actually need to have all five components. But let me talk about two fundamental properties of the von Neumann model. I mentioned one, I'm gonna mention the other one also. It was kind of obvious, but it's called a stored program computer. Uh, model also. Instructions are in memory, basically. It has two key properties, which is 
The first one is a stored program. And the second one is what I already talked about, sequential instruction process. But let's cover them both again. So stored program says instructions are stored in a linear memory array. So you have memory. Memory stores both instructions and data. And instructions are also stored in memory. Uh, and memory is unified between instructions and data, as I said. Uh, so how, the question becomes now, how do you distinguish between instructions and data? And the idea is basically, actually, you don't. Instructions are also data. But sometimes you interpret them as instructions that are going to be processed by the machine. And when is that interpreted as instruction? Depends on the control unit. This control unit is very powerful, basically. If you go back to the control unit, if the program counter points to a memory location, it's going to interpret that memory location as an instruction. It's going to try, that, try to decode that word uh, as an instruction, basically. That's the idea. Instructions and, are, are de and data are not fundamentally different, except if the control unit points to a memory location, it's going to be treated as an instruction. And it, you'd better have an instruction over there, of course, otherwise you'll have a bug in your program. Right? So basically, the interpretation of a stored value depends on the control signals. And again, I, I will repeat this. Uh, if the program counter or instruction pointer points to a memory location, and then the fetch process gets started, uh, that, data lo uh, that location in the memory is treated as an instruction. Okay. The second uh, uh, property is sequential instruction processing, which is one instruction is processed, meaning fetched, executed, and completed at a time. Program counter identifies that current instruction, instruction pointer, in other words. And program counter is advanced sequentially, except for control transfer instruction. So program counter is zero to begin with. It becomes one next. It becomes two next. It becomes three next, if this is a word addressable and each instruction is a word. We'll see byte addressable computers in a little bit also, and we'll talk about that. So keep these two properties in mind. They're very fundamental, OK? So you may also ask, for example, uh, when do you interpret a memory location value as a data value? And we will see that also. Whenever you have a load instruction, and the load instruction generates an address, and that address is used to index memory, then you actually treat the memory location as a data value, and you input that to the ALU, for example, arithmetic logic unit, so that it can be processed. Or you input that to the register file so that you can actually uh, store the data value inside the register file. OK, so two fundamental properties. Stored program, no uh, instructions and data are unified. And sequential instruction processing, one instruction at a time. And you go to the next instruction incrementally. OK, now let's go into LC3, a von Neumann machine. Uh, I'm going to give you examples from LC3. I'm also going to give you examples from MIPS. I like LC3 because it's very simple to understand. MIPS is also simple to understand. But in the end, ISAs are like programming languages. Different ISAs have a lot of similarities, some differences also. But if you understand the fundamentals, you can learn one ISA, and then you can use the ISA, use that knowledge to learn other ISAs very easily. LC3 and MIPS actually have a lot of similarities. MIPS and RISC-V are actually very similar to each other. ARM and MIPS are actually somewhat similar to each other, except ARM has more complicated instructions. X86 is uh, somewhat similar, but it's much more sophisticated and complicated. That's why we're not covering X86. Uh, today, but we will talk about some examples from x86 in the next lectures. Let me give, let me let's talk about LC3. So when I actually was preparing the slides last year, uh, when I put LC3, a von Neumann machine, on PowerPoint, PowerPoint gave me this really funny machine. Uh, I don't know if this is a von Neumann machine, but I like I like keeping it uh, because it kind of looks cool, right? Because LC3 is actually, as far as I know, no LC3 machine is built. They're not sold clearly. This is an instructional computer, but PowerPoint decided that this fits. A little computer three, apparently, with some artificial intelligence that it's using or not using. I don't know. But keep in mind that real computers are actually von Neumann machines. So the cores you see over here, uh, these performance cores, efficiency cores, they're von Neumann cores. Now, I'm not talking about the neural engine accelerator. It uses, it, it uses some other principles like systolic arrays that we will talk about in lecture 19 or so. But the cores, the general purpose parts of the system, are actually von Neumann machines. We will cover GPUs also. GPUs are fundamentally von Neumann machines, but they extend von Neumann to multiprocessing, as we will see, uh, using a, a slight a different paradigm so that they can be much more powerful. OK, this is another example, uh, Intel Alder Lake. These are also von Neumann machines. The cores inside here are von Neumann cores. Again, I'm not talking about the accelerators. Accelerators may be slightly different, but again, they're extensions of the von Neumann uh, model. And another one Neumann machine is AMD, and another one Neumann machine is IBM. So basically, I could keep doing this for all processors, but I would prefer doing it for LC3. Uh, let's uh, stay for five more minutes, and I'm going to give you a 10-minute break, as usual. Uh, so I'm going to do it for LC3, because LC3 is really no different from what I showed you over here, in a sense. It's just simpler, basically. 
all of the other processors operate based on similar principles. We'll, we're going to build up to them. We're going to be actually much, 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 much more powerful. But today we need to learn the fundamentals of how we can operate, how we can design uh, a von Neumann machine. So let me spend some time on the slide because this slide is important. Now, let's take a look over here. Here we have a processing unit somewhat. You can see an ALU. You can see a register file. You can see some MUXs also here. If you have memory, as you can see, we have MAR and MDR. It should also be green, but I mean, that's okay. Uh, and then we have a control unit, as you can see. This, I mean, some of this is control unit, some of this is data path. Unfortunately, it's just uh, overmarked, but that's okay. You can see an instruction register over here. You can see a program counter somewhere over here, as you can see. And then you can see ways of updating the program counter. And then you have input and output. So you can clearly identify these in a von Neumann machine. And if I were doing this for an in Intel Alder Lake, I would also be able to do this relatively easily, except it's going to be a much more complicated machine. Okay, so the way we will denote, so this is a microarchitecture actually. I'm showing you the microarchitecture of this machine. And the way we denote this microarchitecture is we have basically different components. These are control signals. Control signals are actually arrows that are not uh, shaded. You can see this is a control signal. This arrow that's not shaded is a control signal. Load register, whether you're loading into the register files, a control signal. These MUXs have control signals. These control signals are actually generated by this finite state machine that decodes the instruction. So this is the control unit. Control unit generates the control signals so that it can basically orchestrate how the machine operates. And we will see this with instructions uh, soon. So these are data signals. You can see that data signals are marked, shaded. Uh, they're black. Uh, you can see that control signals are white. That's a, that's a very powerful convention that's used in essentially all schematics that I know of. Uh, memory is 16-bit addressable in LC3. And 16-bit happens to be a word. You can see that registers are actually 16 bits and ALU gets 16 bit inputs over here. And there's a memory address register and memory data register as we have seen earlier. And they're connected to a single bus over here. We've seen this bus kind of in prior lectures also. There you can see that keyboard has a keyboard data register and keyboard status register and display has a display data register and display status register. We're not going to talk a lot about them, but keep in mind that they're also connected to the bus over here. They can communicate with the processor and they can communicate with memory as well. ALU, as you can see, it has two inputs, one output. It's 16 bits, so the word length is 16 bits. And it has a control signal saying what ALU function it should for perform. It, it can perform four different ALU functions since LC3 is a simple machine. We have eight general purpose registers over here. You can see the address bits. Uh, source register one is addressed using three bits. Source register two is addressed using three bits. Destination register is addressed three bits. Load register means write enable signal to the register file. So you can see that these are actually components that we have seen. We can actually, we know how to build these components. We know how to build a register file today. Okay, you can see the instruction register over here. This is basically you fetch from the program counter from memory location. And that memory location, the, the contents of the memory location that's pointed to by the program counter gets loaded into the instruction register. That's our instruction bits. And these bits get decoded so that the control unit knows how to execute that instruction. That's, what, that's the purpose of this finite state machine over here. And you know exactly what a finite state machine is to, since we covered it earlier, right? And you can see that uh, there's a program counter. I've already shown it to you, but somehow my computer froze right now. Okay. Okay, there's a program counter which stores the address of the instruction to be fetched. And then it can be incremented as you can see, or it can be changed in some other way. We'll see both ways of changing the program counter. And there's a finite state machine that essentially generates the control signals that control the execution of the entire system. And this is really the entire system. There are some boxes that are not shown, for example, the finite state machine is not shown, which is really important, but it's not shown. And some other boxes over here that are not fully shown, but we will complete some of these boxes uh, over time. And you can also read uh, the Pat and Patel book so that you can complete them on your own if you wish. And then there's a clock. Don't forget the clock. This is a synchronous machine. So clock is really clocking all of the registers, even though it's not shown everywhere. It's clocking the program counter. It's clocking the stuff over here, the finite state machine over here. It's clocking essentially everything. So state transitions to any stateful elements, state any register basically happen at the clock edge. Don't forget that. Again, this is based on sequential logic principles that we have seen. And we've also, also already seen the ALU operation here. And there's a gate ALU signal we have seen. This is a tri-state buffer, right? If you want to, for example, take the ALU result and put it into a register file, you can basically gate the ALU result coming out of here, enable this uh, enable input uh, to the uh, to the tri-state buffer, which takes the ALU output over here, puts it onto the bus. And then you can also set the load reg over here such that the data on the bus gets written into the register file. That's how we can communicate data across this bus into 
different parts of a system. So you could also take the gate ALU results and write it into the memory data register, right? And we will see examples of that. Store instructions do that. Okay, so we covered uh, this one Neumann machine very uh, at, a, at a high level. Now we're going to go into instruct. Uh, we're going to go into instru uh, different instructions and how we execute them. But this is a great place to take a break. Uh, let's take a break for ten minutes, and we'll be back uh, at the uh, essentially when the bell rings. Okay, I'm going to mute over here and keep the slide uh, during the break. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask uh, TAs in the room. There's Juan, uh, there's John, there's Mohammed, and there's uh, Konstantinos in the room. And feel free to ask them. Uh, they can convey it to me uh, if, if there is a question that uh, I can answer.
<laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing, it's just ADHD. <laughs> no, no, OCD, sorry. <laughs> Oh, you didn't provide the grant. That's why. So we never actually used the actual app. So it actually asked for the permission now. So it should which be... window and the five windows were the task. But I was projecting from my screen, and like I was using my camera. Yeah, yeah. But this is better because of this. Let me show you. We have a wide enough. I'm not sure if it's good. <laughs> why is it? I don't see why it's better. <laughs> Basically, if my camera is more on the back, Maybe you can have this. Yes, I got it already. Oh, okay. I have it there.
Okay, I think we can get started uh, and we can continue. People can he still hear me, right? Okay, hopefully that's a yes. Okay, I'll animate these. So basically we just covered uh, a microarchitecture of a von Neumann machine. And this is a very simple microarchitecture. We're gonna start with simple microarchitectures and build to much more sophisticated machines of today. Okay, but before we go into it, uh, we need to see how the instructions can actually enable this microarchitecture to do uh, what the contract uh, specifies us to do. And that's basically the stored program and sequential execution, as we will see. Uh, so instructions and data are stored in memory, as we discussed. Typically, the instruction length is the word length. The processor fetches instructions from memory sequentially. It fetches one instruction, and then it decodes and executes the instruction. It continues with the next instruction, right? Decode means figure out what to do with the instruction. Decode is decoder, as we discussed, right? And the address of the current instruction is stored in the program counter, but that gets incremented during the instruction processing cycle. Uh, so what is that address? If we have word addressable memory, the processor increments the PC by one in LC3, for example. If we have byte addressable memory, the processor increments the PC by the instruction length in bytes. So each instruction is 32 bits or one word length in bytes, uh, in, uh, one word length, uh, uh, in MIPS. Uh, as a result, you need to increment the program counter by four because program uh, counter is byte addressable. Remember, memory is byte addressable, right? So memory's addressability applies over here also because program counter is just a memory address, essentially. It just specifies which memory address we should look and fetch so that we can interpret that as the instruction to process next. And there's this detail. Uh, basically, the operating system gets involved in setting the program counter also when you first start the machine, for example, or when you first load the program, uh, the operating system sets the program counter to a value and then uh, the processor starts execution uh, that way. Okay, let's take a look at a sample program stored in memory. I don't expect you to understand this program yet, but this gives you an idea of what the program kind of looks like and how it's stored. This is a sample MIPS program. We have four instructions stored in consecutive words in memory. Uh, you can see load, add, add immediate, subtract. We will see all of them actually. And the machine code looks like this. If you have the instruction set manual, you would basically can translate this to the machine code, the assembly code to the machine code, because machine code is just an encoding of the instructions as you will see in a little bit. And these instructions, this code gets stored in these addresses. And the first address is the program counter. You can see that this is the first address over here. And this is the 32-bit value that corresponds to the first instruction, load runs instruction that operates on this register and this memory address calculation, another register over here, as you can see. And then the next instruction is in address, this address is PC plus four. The next instruction is four incremented by four. Again, it's all byte addressable, as you can see. So it's very similar to the memory layout that we have seen earlier. And everything is byte addressable, and we can see the instructions as words over here. Okay, hopefully this makes sense. Uh, okay, and then the PC gets incremented by four, and then you execute the next instruction after you finish executing the prior instruction. Okay, as we discussed earlier, instruction is the basic, most basic unit of computer processing. That's, that's what the programmer can write at, as the most basic thing. The programmer cannot do something more basic than an instruction in a general purpose computer. Instructions are words in the language of a computer. You can think of it that way. And instructions that architecture is really the vocabulary. What kind of words you can use to construct programs that uh, enable the computer to execute, basically. Nope. Okay. So the language of the computer can be written as in different ways, basically. There are different specifications. You can write, uh, you can basically communicate to the computer using a machine language. This is a computer readable representation, ones and zeros, essentially, which is what we, sh what we showed earlier. Sorry. This is the machine code over here on the bottom left. Uh, or you could do an assembly language, which is actually uh, this one on the top over here, right? Assembly language is a human readable representation, clearly, right? And these are really equivalent, equal to each other. Basically, once you know the encodings of an instruction, you can go from assembly to machine language. And once you know what assembly mnemonics to use, you can go from machine language to assembly language as well. So now we will study some LC3 instructions and MIPS instructions. But before that, we will introduce the instruction cycle. But keep in mind that principles are all similar in all ISAs, whether you're doing x86, ARM, RISC-V, Spark, Alpha, or whatever ISA you're interested in, instruction set architecture, the principles are actually very similar. The instruction set may be very large. In x86, for example, I think there are 
hundreds of instructions, maybe even thousands right now, I don't know. Uh, but uh, in, 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 in MIPS, it's much smaller set. In LC3, it's even smaller set. MIPS is very similar to RISC-V. If you, if you want to know, uh, RISC-V is clearly getting popular today, but RISC-V is very, a lot of the RISC-V principles are very much based on MIPS. MIPS is a very old instruction set architecture. RISC-V is, even though it's a relatively young instruction set architecture, it's very, 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 very similar. Okay, so what does an instruction consist of? An instruction is made up of two parts. We call them opcode and operands. Opcode specifies what the instruction does. It's an add, is the load, is a multiply, is a divide. What is it basically? And operand specified who the instruction is to do it to, meaning what, what do you add essentially? What are the oper operands you're going to operate on? Both are specified in the instruction format. And we're going to look at this instruction format. Instruction format is also called instruction encoding. If we're going to look at LC3 first, LC3 instruction consists of 16 bits. They're specified like this, 15 through zero, as you can see. And this is one example instruction. This is an add instruction, for example, and it has 16 bits. And the instruction format specifies how you interpret which bits. For example, bits 15 through 12 in LC3 always specify the opcode. So you can see that there are four bits over here. The value of which determine what the opcode is, what the instruction uh, should do essentially. So 0001 means it's an add instruction, okay? And some other value would be a, uh, uh, XOR instruction LC3B, for example. Some other value would be a load instruction. We will see those. And this is all specified in the instruction set manual. You don't need to memorize these clearly, right? Okay, so now you know what the instruction should do, uh, which is uh, the opcode, but who should it do it to? Meaning, what are the operands? Bits 11 through zero are used to figure out where the operands are. Basically, these are the operands. You can see that this instruction format, add instruction format, says that these bits, uh, this, uh, the, uh, are the destination register. These bits are the source register. And these bits are another source register. So you have two source registers. You add them, put the result into the destination register specified by these bits. Make sense? And you can see that this is six, this is two, and this is two. Uh, the, sorry, this is six also. So about this add is, this instruction format tells us that this is an add. And add operates on source registers R2 and R6 and puts the result into destination register R6. Now, there's some more detail that we will cover later, especially related to bit five, because if this bit five was one, then this would not be a register. If this bit five was one, then this would be taken as an immediate value, and you would add R2 to an immediate value. And we will see that later on. So you can actually play a lot of tricks in instruction encoding to specify your uh, operands differently. Okay, now let's talk about instruction types. There are three, and all instructions are encoded in some instruction format, but they have different types also. There are three main types of instructions. One, are, uh, one is operate instructions. These execute operations or functions in the ALU, essentially, functional units. Data movement instructions read from or write to memory, loads and stores, es 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 essentially. Control flow instructions change the sequence of execution. And if you want to have a von Neumann model, you really need to have all of these instructions to make it comfortable for the user. There's clearly, or, or programmer, there's clearly a minimum set of instructions you can have. Actually, you can specify one instruction that can do a lot of these but I'm not going to talk about that. So let us start with some example instructions that are commonly found in computers. So clearly, operate instructions operate in the ALU. And a famous example of operate instructions is addition, of course. We always perform addition, right? Uh, you, can, you can perform multiplication as a series of additions and shifts, for example. Uh, so this is high level code looks like this, A equals B plus C. Assembly code may look like this, add A, uh, Add into A, B plus C, basically, in this case, you can read it that way. And there's some convention as to which one is the source register, which one is the destination register. In this case, this is the destination register, A is the destination, and this is the source. In fact, this doesn't even talk about registers right now, it's talking about variables. Uh, add is the mnemonic to indicate the operation to perform, basically, in assembly. B and C are the source operands, and A is the destination operand. Essentially, the semantic specification of this assembly instruction is A should get the value of B plus C, variables B plus C. Okay, but now we're gonna go into one level beyond, uh, below and talk about registers. You need to really allocate registers to these variables. Basically, you, uh, we map variables to registers. We don't keep them ABC because registers are what gets communicated to the architecture. Right? Architecture understands the registers. I have registers zero through 31. I have registers zero through eight uh, in LC3, zero through 31 in MIPS. That's what we should communicate to the hardware. That's, that's the contract between us. We did not, have a contract uh, about ABC. ABC, they don't understand. Okay, 
So these are the register numbers, basically. We map uh, the register, uh, we map each of the variables to the register numbers, and you can do some sort of mapping. And this is a convention again. LC3 uses R1, R2, R0. MIPS uses $S1, $S2, $S0, based on the uh, kind of mapping that I showed you earlier uh, that had the entire MIPS register file, if you remember. Uh, but this is uh, how we map the registers. Once you map the registers, you have specified the instruction, basically. This is the LC3 assembly version of that edition. Add into R0, R1 plus R2. So this is the encoding, basically. Opcode of add is one. Destination register is zero. Source register one is one. Source register two is two. And these bits are supposed to be zeros. Actually, this definitely has to be zero. And this is really forced to be zero, I believe. But it's really a don't care. But I don't know if the ISA specifies that don't care. OK, machine code looks like this, essentially, basically. This is the 16 bit. Remember, instructions in uh, LC3 are 16 bits. And this is the machine code that you have. OK, and these are the 16 bits over here. So how did I come up with this? Well, I basically used the manual. OK, I'm going to show you the manual. This is a benefit of being in my office. This is the manual. The manual is in this book. Oh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, sorry, so I'm going to actually temporarily unblur myself. OK, let's do this. OK, basically, this is the book, uh, Introduction to Computing Systems. I, can, I think you can see it. At the end of this, you see a manual, right? Oh, sorry. Okay, I think you can see it now. That's good. This manual basically shows the instruction formats. There are 16 instructions over here. And the and add is at the top of it, if you can see. I'm going to put it even closer over here. It basically specifies what the instruction should look like. So I did not come up with this as magic. Someone told me uh, that I should do it this way. And who is that? That's really the design of the ISA in the end. Okay. So basically, the designer of the ISA said, this is the hardware software interface. If you tell me this bit string, if you will, these 16 bits, and if you point the program counter to it, I'm going to interpret that as an add instruction. I'm going to do what I promised, add these two source register values into the destination register. Okay, And the key is really the opcode over here. OK, and the, you can write the machine code in short and hexadecimal, as you can see over here. right? OK, hopefully this is clear. Now we've actually. We know how to specify things to the machine. OK, let's talk about instruction format. LC3 has an instruction format. It's called the operate instruction format. It looks like this, basically. All operate instructions look like this in LC3. You have the opcode at the top th four bits, and you have destination register here, the source register here in the next three and three bits. This has to be 0 if you want this to be a source register over here. OK? And up quote, well, I already actually told you exactly this. For example, add is 0001, and is 0101. Up quote determines what the instruction does. SR1 and SR2 are source registers, and DR is the destination register. This is the operating instruction format without immediates. This is called the register uh, mode. And we're going to talk about that. And the semantics for add is basically source register 1 plus source register 2 gets written into destination register. And semantics for and is take the values in source register one and source register two, do a bitwise end of them, and store the result into destination register. That's the idea. So instruction set architecture, this manual basically that I showed you, specifies what the semantics of an instruction is and what the encoding of an instruction is. So it basically tells you what the instruction does as well as how you should encode it. OK. OK. So this is the example basically at that I showed you earlier. Uh, this is a complete encoding of the at. That takes R2 and R6 and stores the result into R6. OK. It, uh, so if you look at MIPS, the idea is very similar. This is just to illustrate that MIPS is not that different from LC3. Basically, the assembly language looks very similar, except it has different register names. Field values, OK, the, this is the instruction encoding is 32 bits, as you can see. It's larger. And opcode is still at the top. You can see there is a register source, regist a second source, and a destination register and a function over here, which is part of the opcode extension, if you will. And there's a shift amount over here. But this is an operate instruction format in, LC, uh, in MIPS. And operate, uh, add is a particular operate instruction. So if you want to encode add, this is what uh, the machine code specifies. And essentially, you're adding RS to RT. These are the fields. These are five-bit fields. I will show you the exact uh, register numbers. Because MIPS has 32-bit registers, these have to be five-bit fields. And the destination register 16 gets uh, RD. So why you may ask, why is it 16, 17, 18? Because S0, S1, S2 in the assembler convention, uh, in the assembly convention, corresponds to 16, 17, 18. If you remember that slide where I showed you, actually, I'll try to get back to it very quickly. This slide, yeah. 
the slide basically says S0, S7 are register numbers 1623. So you need to know this as an assembly language writer. It's just a mapping basically. Okay, so this is the semantics and this is the machine code encoding. As you can see, top six bits are the opcode and this is the function, bottom six bits are the function of the opcode. That those together specify the ad and then the remainders specify the operands. Okay, and this is the hexadecimal 32-bit encoding, as you can see. Okay, so this is the ad instruction format. So general R-type format, it's an operate type format. It's called R-type in MIPS. We will see these in more detail in the next lecture. You have three register operands, as you can see, and it looks like this, basically. Let's cover this. Zero is the opcode always. RS and RT are the source registers. You can see that there are five bits. RD is the five-bit destination register. Shift amount is there for only shift operations. This is, again, designed by the ISA designer. You don't have any control over it. The ISA designer gives you this, and they basically say, this is the shift amount. You need to tell me the shift amount if you're operating a shift. For any other operation, it's, these, these bits, I believe, can be zero. Uh, if you set them to something else, then you need to look at the manual, basically, how to set them. Funct is the function, essentially, the operation in R-type instructions. Basically, opcode of R-type instructions is always zero. Function specifies whether it's an add, whether it's an and, whether it's a nor, et cetera, XOR, et cetera. So basically, these two things specify the opcode together. This is really called the opcode, and this is called a function of an R-type instruction that gets fed to the ALU, arithmetic logic unit. OK, so hopefully this is clear. Now let's talk about some other instructions, uh, reading operands from memory. With operate instructions, such as addition, we tell the computer to execute arithmetic or logic computation in the ALU. But we also need to bring the data, access the operands from memory into the registers first. Right? We can operate on registers uh, with operate instructions, because these are load store ISAs, meaning you have to bring the data from memory into the registers first so that you can operate on them. OK, so we, we need these instructions, load instructions and store instructions. Essentially, load the operands from memory to registers and store them from registers to memory after we're done with them, after we don't need a register, for example. So let's take a look at how we read or load from memory. Writing or storing is performed in a similar way, but we will talk about that later, probably later today or tomorrow, depending on how fat, uh, where, where we end up today. Okay, this is an example, load word. Uh, let's, take, let's start with a word addressable memory. By the addressable memory, basically we'll multiply some con uh, things with some constants. Word addressable memory may be easy to think about, but let's start with that. So we have a load word instruction. In fact, LC3 is word addressable, so it's easy to think about. Let's take a look at high level code. This is an array in indexing, right? Basically the variable little a gets arrays, uh, a word from array at index i, right? So we're loading from, a location from an array indexed by i and taking that word and putting that into a variable. This is a high level code then. You can potentially write this high level code in any language. Assembly looks like this basically. Load into a from address big A, large A, indexed by an offset i. So basically, how do you calculate the address right now? You basically take the base address of the array, which starts assume that at, uh, the base address is at a, add to it a value of i, essentially. Okay, we're gonna see that. So load is a mnemonic to indicate the load word operation assembly. A is the beta address of the array. I is the offset. This is also called the immediate or literal. It's essentially a constant. This is constant provided by the programmer, right? Of, I mean, it's a variable, but it changes every time it takes a different value. So you can actually encode it potentially as a constant uh, in every iteration. Okay. A is a destination operand, the small a. Uh, and uh, semantics basically says access memory at location address by base address plus the offset i, get the data word over there, put it into this variable a. So that's the semantics of the assembly. Now let's go a little bit step further and map this into LC3 and MIPS. Let's take a look at LC3 assembly. Let, and now I'm going to put a value to a, a value to i, which is two. So I want to load the word not at zero, not at one, but at location at index two. And LC3 assembly looks like this basically because it's word addressable. You have a load register instruction. It loads uh, a location from memory addressed by uh, the base address in register zero, adds to it number two, immediate value two, calculates the address, goes to memory, gets the data at that location, and places the data into R3, register three. And I just said what, I, uh, what is written over here. Access memory by computing the address this way base registers value plus two, immediate value two, and then get the data and put it into R3. Okay, MIPS assembly now. Assume that MIPS is word addressable. We're going to look at byte addressable next. Essentially the same basically. 
it's just the word, uh, uh, the, the, the mnemonic uh, in, in the ISA is different. The instruction is different, LDR, load word in MIPS. And you can see that the register encoding is different. And also the way you write is a bit different, right? But it essentially does the same thing. Memory should get the base register plus offset. Uh, basically, you access memory using the address calculated by base register plus offset, get the data, and put it into the destination register S3 in this case. So basically, these instructions enable you to access memory, but they also use a particular addressing mode. Addressing mode is how do you calculate the address to access memory or to access registers? And this particular addressing mode is called base plus offset memory address because you have a base register plus an offset and you add them up and that's your address, okay? That sounds easy. And this happens a lot in array, address, array accesses, for example, or data structure accesses in general. And now you can map this, you can map any high level code to this high level code, uh, to, to this sort of memory addressing actually. This sort of memory addressing is very powerful. You can map any high level code to this. And I'll let you think about that. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about assembly programming tomorrow. Okay, now let's take a look at byte addressable MIPS. We, we were assuming word addressable. Let's take a look at byte addressable. So assume that MIPS is byte addressable, meaning every word over here is four bytes and each byte is a unique address. The MIPS assembly corresponding to the high level code essentially requires uh, a, an immediate, an offset of eight. Why? We basically, each location has four bytes and we're accessing location at two. Uh, the, we're accessing the word uh, at, uh, sorry, let me, let me say it again. Each word in this array has four bytes and we want to access word two, not word zero, not word one, word two. And where does word two start? Word zero starts at address zero. Word one starts at address four because it's byte addressable. And word two starts at address eight, right? That's why we have eight over here. The offset is eight. Okay, so basically it's essentially the same thing. Address is calculated by taking the base register's value, adding to it offset eight, going to memory and getting the data and placing the data, the word, uh, inside S3. This is load word. You could have loaded a byte also. There's a load byte instruction as well that can load one single byte into a particular location in a register. You could have, for example, uh, loaded byte nine. You could do that actually easily, but uh, this example doesn't show that clear. So the byte address is calculated as, but, but this doesn't, uh, basically this example doesn't ask you to load byte nine, right? This example asks you to load a word. That's, what, that's how I specify things. A word that's of 32 bits into uh, this variable. Okay, byte address is calculated as the word address, which is, uh, in this case, two, in, if you will, times bytes per word. That's why we multiply this two by four, because we have four bytes per word. So hopefully this is easy. This is very similar to what we have discussed earlier in the lecture also. So if you have four bytes per word in MIPS, you multiply uh, this two by four, as we did. If LC3 were byte addressable, in, in other words, LC3B is byte, byte addressable, actually, you have two bytes per word in that case, because words are 16 bits, and you have two bytes per word. Uh, then this, uh, you would multiply this two by two. If you had an, another machine where you had 64, um, uh, I don't know, where you had eight bytes per word, for example, and this was 64 bits, then you would multiply this two by eight and this, this constant would be 16 over here. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. This is essentially, uh, again, uh, based on the uh, byte addressability, addressability of the machine, this is how you need to calculate the address. Okay, now let's take a look at instruction format with immediate also. So how do we actually encode this? So this is, uh, this is essentially what we have seen earlier. Uh, this is the MIPS version. Uh, this is the LC3 version. Essentially the same thing. LC3 is word addressable, MIPS is byte addressable. Remember that, that's why we have two versus eight over here. And this is the encoding in LC3. Again, how did I figure that out? I took the manual. Well, you may not be able to see it, but this is the manual and this is the page. And that tells me, uh, <coughs> Yeah, uh, that tells me how do, you, how do I encode a load, load register instruction. Similarly, MIPS has another manual. Uh, oops, sorry. And you can find that in your book also, h and book. And this is the encoding of the load word instruction. Opcode is 35. Opcode happens to be 35 in MIPS assembly for load word. Opcode happens to be six for LDR. Uh, and you can see that, uh, okay, let's, let's finish the actually LC3. Uh, opcode is six for LDR in LC3, destination register is three, base register is two, and then there's a six bit offset, as you can see, uh, that's encoded uh, here. 
and we put we put the value two over here. MIPS is very similar, very very similar actually, as you can see. Even though it's thirty two bits, sorry about that. Uh, the opcode is of course different, thirty five in this case. This opcode specifies how you interpret the rest of the bits to the machine. The rest of the bits says this is a source register, uh, and this is uh, the destination register. Source register is one of the base registers as zero. And uh, the destination register is S3 over here. This is how it's encoded, as you can see. And uh, this, there's the immediate. There's a value for immediate. This is 16 bits. Because you have longer instruction words uh, in MIPS, you can store longer immediates, as you can see, longer offsets, if you will. So you can actually uh, address a larger range in MIPS. So in MIPS, this is called an I-type instruction. In uh, LC3, it's called a data moment instruction. It has a, all data moment instructions have similar encodings in LC3. OK. So hopefully this makes sense. If there are any burning questions, I can take them. Now uh, we will move into instruction processing cycles. Now, now we've covered a lot of formatting and how to map things to instructions. Uh, now let's talk about how we really execute these instructions. Okay, I don't hear anything, so I'm going to continue, but feel free to interrupt me if there's a burning question. Now this is going to be more interesting, if you will, in the sense that we're gonna process these instructions. Uh, basically, uh, we've seen the instructions, but how are they executed? How does the machine actually take one instruction, execute them, and then move to the next instruction? Essentially, using the instructions, we can speak the language of the computer and we can communicate with the computer. So if you know how to tell the computer to execute computations in the ALU, for example, using an addition, access operands from memory by using the load word instruction, but how are they actually executed on the computer? This is dictated by uh, a process called the instruction cycle or instruction processing cycle. This is not to be confused with the clock cycle. This is actually independent of the clock cycle, but we call it an instruction processing cycle. Every instruction goes through this cycle. And it's a cycle because we keep, keep doing it over and over. And that's the process of executing an instruction. Instruction cycle is a sequence of steps or phases that an instruction goes through to be executed. And it consists of six phases, as you can see. Fetch, we need to first fetch the instruction, decode it, evaluate the address of the operands, fetch the operands, execute the instruction, store the result, and then move to the next instruction. That's the idea over here. And we're gonna look at every single step initially. Not all instructions require the six phases. For example, load a register does not require execute because it doesn't require an ALU operation, right? It requires just loading from memory and putting the data into the register. Similarly, add doesn't require evaluate address because it doesn't need to access memory, okay? So keep in mind that not all instructions require the six phases, but there are some instructions that require all six phases. Intel x86 instruction, for example, this add, a uh, special add instruction, an example instruction with six phases. What this instruction does is it takes this EAX register. It's a register. It's, it's an encoding of a register, name of a register in x86 architecture. It takes the EAX register. It uses it as an address. It accesses memory and it gets the data from that memory location. And then it gets the data from EDX register, another register. It adds those two values and stores the results back into the memory location pointed to by EAX. So basically you have a, a data operand coming from a register, another data operand from coming from memory, and the destination operand is stored in memory. This is a very sophisticated, complicated instruction compared to what we are going to see because x86 ISA is not necessarily a load store ISA. You don't have to load things into the registers, basically. You can directly operate on memory locations. And you can see that partially you operate on registers here, partially you operate on memory locations. So it's a more, more powerful ISA, as you can see. But it's also more complicated, so it's easier to learn LC3 and MIPS first, and then you can easily generalize to x86. Okay, so this is the instruction processing cycle. And never forget that after one instruction finishes, another instruction starts. Basically, at some point here, you increment the program counter. We'll see it in the fetch stage. You'll increment the program counter, and then the next instruction fetches from the next program counter. And then the next instruction fetches from the next program counter, and the cycle keeps going on and on until you halt until you finish the program, basically. There's a special instruction that communicates to the operating system, this program is done. At that point, the program uh, finishes. But we're not going to talk about those special instructions at this point. We're not there yet. So let's take a look at each of these steps. And I think hopefully it'll be intuitive in terms of how a computer executes an instruction because every instruction goes through these steps. And you can imagine every, basically if I throw you an instruction, you can tell me how it goes through these steps after we do these exercises. Okay, let's take a look at the fetch stage first. I'll, these are called stages or phases. I'm gonna use both interchangeably. But the fetch phase obtains the instruction from memory 
and loads it into the instruction register. Remember the instruction register in the control units? We're going to load it with the instruction encoding. It's the format of the instruction. And this phase is common to every instruction type. Every instruction needs to be fetched clearly so that we know what we can do, what, what the computer should do. The complete description of the phase looks like this, basically. First, we load the memory address register with the contents of the PC and simultaneously increment the PC because we're going to move to the next instruction. We're not going to need the exact same PC at this point. Okay. And then we interrogate memory, meaning we access memory. This results in the instruction being placed in the MDR by memory. So basically, we, uh, we access memory, and memory contains the uh, value of the PC, meaning the address of the instruction. And the memory gives us, after some time, it could be one clock cycle, it could be multiple clock cycles. It depends on how long the memory takes and uh, also the design of your finite state machine. After some time, you get the value of the location that's pointed to by the program counter in the MDR, memory data register. And then the step three is to load the instruction register with the contents of the memory data register. That way, we've taken a value from memory pointed to by the program counter and put it into the instruction register. We've interpreted that value, memory data value, as an instruction. OK, so hopefully this is clear. Let's take a look at how this happens in the LC3 data path that we showed earlier. Remember, look at that pro program counter over here. What we want to do is take the program counter, put it into the MAR, memory address register. So this is what we're going to do. Program counter gets the, we, we need to act, set the gate PC signal so that program counter gets loaded onto the processor bus over here and then gets into the MAR. So we need to actually set the LDMAR signal. And simultaneously, PC plus one gets incremented and we need to set the PC max multiplexer signal such that we select this input, this data input of the multiplexer so that at the end of the clock cycle, program counter gets incremented. So this is a sequential execution, a sequential machine again, right? At the end of the clock cycle, register gets, registers get the new values. So for the full clock cycle, we have the program counter value available. That clock cycle we use to take the program counter into the MAR. At the end of the clock cycle, MAR gets the value of the program counter <coughs> and the PC, new PC gets incremented. But MAR gets the old PC. It doesn't get the incremented PC. That's why we designed the sequential logic the way we designed it, right? For the full clock cycle, you have the register contents available. Only at the edge of the clock cycle, at the end of the clock cycle, or at the beginning of the next clock cycle, in the rising edge of the clock, the registers get their new values, right? So hopefully that's clear. And uh, this is one step. I'm, I'm taking some time on this one, but I'm going to go through uh, the other steps faster. So now PC is loaded into MAR. Now we basically access memory. Access memory means enable memory. There, it depends on how we actually do the memory. But in, in your book, it talks about enabling memory and setting the read bit. And for some time later, maybe several clock cycles, it, it, this gets controlled by the finite state machine over here, actually. Uh, sometime later, you get the memory data register value over here. And once you get the memory data register, it's basically the contents of the instruction here because memory was accessed with the address, which was pointed to by the program counter. And step three is to take the memory data register, which is gated onto the bus, enable the signal over here. Now the memory data register value goes onto the bus, and then we want it into the instruction register. And then at the end of that clock cycle, we need to enable, well, we need to enable the load IR signal so that we load uh, the instruction register with the contents of the memory data register. So hopefully that's clear. You need to set the control signals accordingly for this to work, of course, right? For each step, you have control signals that you need to set accordingly so that the machine does the fetch in these three steps over here, okay? Okay, so I'm going to move on to the decode. Now we have the instruction that is pointed to by the program counter, the current instruction. It, the encoding of the instruction is the instruction register. Now we can decode it. And the decode phase identifies the instruction. It also generates a set of control signals to process the identified instruction in the later phases of the instruction cycle, because we know what the instruction is after decoding. And we call the decoder from lecture five. Now we use a four to 16 decoder, which identifies which of the 16 opcodes is going to be processed. The input is going to be the four bits, the top bits of the instruction register. Remember, these are, this is the opcode. This is the opcode of the instruction LC3. And the remaining 12 bits identify what else is needed to process the instruction, like the source registers, destination registers, whether you use an immediate or a re source register, et cetera. So let's take a look at decode over here. It identifies the instruction to be processed and it's 
uh, it also generates a set of control signals to process the instruction. Basically, you take the four bits of the instruction and decode it. You generate a lot of control signals based on this finite state machine over here. So hopefully this makes sense. We're going to see this decoder later on. Uh, and you can also read your, your, the book actually to see the decoder. But this is really a decoder. Uh, of course, it does other things to generate other control signals, but opcode is really decoded using these four bits. Uh, and you have a four to 16 decoder to identify which opcodes. And control signals are generated based on the opcode. Uh, these are the control signals that actually dictate what happens to everything else in the remaining uh, parts of the instruction execution. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're generated partly by the opcode and partly by the other parts of the instruction. Okay, we call the decoder. We've seen decoders many times, but this is just to jog your memory. We saw a two to four decoder, a four to 16 decoder is very similar. And remember that when I introduced the decoder, uh, the decoder is useful in determining how to interpret a bit pattern. And in this case, the bit pattern is an opcode. And basically we're interpreting what the opcode uh, should do and what control signals sh should it enable for later execution. Okay, next phase is the evaluate address phase. Evaluate address phase computes the address of the memory location that is needed to process the instruction. And we've seen how to compute the address of a memory location using the load instructions, right? Is this phase necessary in load instructions and store instructions? And it computes the address of the data word that is to be read from memory, for example. And by, by adding an offset to the content of a register, right? this is one way of doing the computation. There are other ways as we will see tomorrow, likely. But this is not necessary in add because add doesn't access uh, add doesn't need to access memory to uh, get its operands, right? Because in, in LC3, uh, adds operate on registers only or immediate values and a register. No, no memory locations. Okay, let's take a look at evaluate address in LC3. Basically, LDR calculates the address by adding a register and an immediate. And here's what, how it happens in the data path. So we know that this is an LDR instruction. Our control signals say that we need to take the source register one out and the source register one uh, address is over here. Basically, we access the register file using the source register one address that's coming from the instruction register because we know exactly where the source register one is based on the opcode. And that source register one value, well, uh, source register one's value comes. It gets added to an immediate. Remember the immediate uh, encoding over here, six bit immediate, using another adder over here, and that gets put onto the bus over here. Make sense? Hopefully, this uh, is clear. Clearly, I've added some additional things over here. We will see a more complicated version of this machine later, but it includes this adder, basically. This is called the address calculation adder. It basically takes a base, take base register, adds to an offset specified by the instruction register, calculates the address, and the address gets put on MAR. That's how you can access memory, basically. But that's the next stage. This is just evaluating address. We just evaluate the address. We're going to put it over here and then put it on the MAR. That's the fetch operands page. Fetch operands phase obtains the source operands needed to process the instruction. Uh, in LDR, whoop, something is going too fast here. Okay, in LDR, uh, we load the MAR with the address calculated in the evaluate address phase that I showed you just now. And then we read memory, which places the source operand in MDR. In add, we obtain the source operands from the register file. So add also fetches the operands, but it doesn't need to calculate the address because the address is actually encoded in the instruction already. It's just a register file. Add operates only on register operands. It doesn't need to access memory. Okay. In some microprocessors, operand fetch from register file can be done at the same time. The instruction is being decoded. Sometimes you can move these, uh, uh, move these operand fetch to different parts of the processing cycle, but it doesn't change the fact. We, we basically keep it clean uh, because we call it fetch operands over here. Okay. Let's take a look at fetch operands in LC3. So what does the LDR do? We evaluated the address over here using an adder. We take that address from here and put it onto, into the MAR. And memory after some point becomes ready and takes the data and places it into the MDR, memory data register, right? Okay, so hopefully this is simple. This is very similar to an instruction fetch, if you remember, except what address we put into the MAR was different. We did not put the program counter into the MAR. We put the address we evaluated over here using this adder. Unfortunately, I don't have that adder in this picture, but we should have that in the next iteration of the slides. We put the address over here that we generated and we placed it into the MAR, right? And then the memory gate interpreted, the memory gate was the value in that location into the MDR. So this is how you can distinguish between instructions and data again. We're using the address that's generate, uh, that's, uh, that's evaluated in the evaluated address stage. Okay, so fetch operands and add is, uh, okay, I, I don't have the fetch operands and add, but basically add fetches operands by just 
addressing SR2 and SR1 in the register file. Okay, let's, let's move to the next stage. That was fetch operands. Now execute. Execute happens not for load, it happens for operate instructions. So for example, add, uh, uh, I think something is going fast in my computer. Sorry about this. This is a different computer and sometimes it skips. But basically the ex execute phase executes the instruction. In add, it performs the addition of the ALU. In XOR, it performs a bitwise XOR. Basically it depends on the opcode again. And execute is very simple. Add adds uh, SR1 and SR2. As you can see, this is how we get the data values. SR1 and SR2 comes out of the register file and they get added in the ALU and the result is produced at the output of the ALU. And in the store result stage, we're going to write it back into the register file. Let's take a look at store result stage. Okay, something is still slow over here. Okay, store result phase writes the result to the designated destination. Once store result is completed, a new instruction cycle starts with the fetch phase. Let's take a look at it. So for example, add loads the ALU result into the destination register. Remember, in the execute stage, we have the result of the ALU based on the computation that's done in SR1 and SR2's contents. And now we basically need to gate that result into the bus and the bus is connected to the register file. And we basically load the register, set the register so that we can actually write the data coming out of the ALU output into the register files input over here. And we can specify what destination register it is. It's already specified in the instruction register basically, right? So everything is specified in the instruction register. The machine is just operating based on the specification of the instruction in the instruction register. Everything I said obeys the specification of the instruction, which was loaded into the instruction register. The DR is coming from the instruction register. SR2 and SR1 are coming from the instruction register. Uh, load reg is coming from the control signals that are generated by encode, decoding the instruction register, basically. So all of the control signals are generated based on the instruction we're processing. In, uh, if you look at the store result for load uh, register, basically we had the register uh, value for, uh, we loaded from memory, that's an MDR. We need to gate it onto the bus and we need to place it into the destination register. And that's how this happens. The data values here, you set the gate MDR signal and then the data flows into the register file. You set the destination register and you set the load register to one so that you can write into the destination register. So it's very similar to an add, except the data value you're writing comes from memory as opposed to the result of the ALU, right? So store result phase is very similar as you can see. And that's the instruction cycle. You just complete it basically. You fetch, decode, evaluate address, fetch operands, execute, and store result, and you keep uh, continuing doing this. Okay, now let's talk about changing the sequence of execution very quickly, and then we're going to uh, end this lecture, and then we're going to continue tomorrow. Changing the sequence of execution is also important. A computer program executes in sequence, first instruction, second instruction, third instruction, so on, unless we change the sequence of execution. Control instructions allow a program to execute out of sequence because think about if then else, for example, if you, if you have a condition, you do something. If, you, if, the other, if the condition is not true, you do something else. You need that sort of control. And control instructions allow us to uh, execute out of sequence so that we can implement that sort of control in the higher level semantics of the program. And control instructions enable us to change the PC by loading it during the execute phase, basically, not during the fetch phase. As a, as a result, we can wipe out the incremented PC, which is loaded during the fetch phase. So let's take a look at how we do this. So very simple jump instruction. It's an unconditional branch or jump in LC3. It looks like this, jump, basically change the PC to the contents of register two. That's what it says. This is the encoding, as you can see, there's an opcode, there's a base register, everything else is zeros. And PC gets the value of register two. Sounds nice, right? Basically you can write any value to the program counter, you can write to you can jump to any location in your program right now. This is called a register addressing mode. We use the register's uh, value as an address into the program counter. There are variations of it. I'm not going to go through the details of it. You can find important. Uh, you can find it in the uh, books. But there are variations of this jump as well. Jump in MIPS is a little bit different. It's, it looks like this: jump to a target. This is an offset actually. It's specified in the instruction itself. It's not a register. There's also a register version of it, but it looks like this basically. This is the opcode. This is the target address. And this is it's called a J-type instruction MIPS. And this is how the calculation is done. PC gets the value of top four bits of the PC concatenated with sign extended target address multiplied by four. There's a reason for all of this. This target is uh, byte addressable. That's why you multiplied. Uh, this, is, this is really a word address. That's why you multiply it by four. And then this is a PC relative addressing mode. You concatenate the PC. This is also called pseudo direct addressing mode. You don't need to remember this. But there are also a variation of this, like jump register, which is very similar to the jump in LC3. 
Okay, and that uses the register address symbol. Let's quickly look at this in LC3, and then I'm going to end. Basically, PC update in LC3 is done very simply. Jump loads SR1 into PC, and there's a data path component. As, uh, sorry, this is going very quickly. So you can see that SR1 gets loaded through the PC mux into the program counter, and load PC gets enabled over here. So this is beautiful, basically. We have the data path component to load a register into the program counter over here, controlled by control signals generated by the finite state machine uh, that's controlled by the instruction. Basically, all of it is controlled by the instruction. Now, very quickly, this is the finite state machine, basically. This is an FSM controlling the LC3 processor. And I'm not going to go through the states. I'm going to let you go through the states. Tomorrow, we're going to start with this one. Essentially, these are the states that the program goes through or, or the processor goes through to execute instructions. You go through the fetch. You go through decode. Once you decode, you get, go into instruction-specific states. Uh, you can see here, you store the results and you evaluate the address over here. Uh, basically, this is the jump instruction. Jump instruction goes to one, two, three, four, five, six states in the finite state machine. Okay, this is where I will stop. Uh, we will start tomorrow with the instructions at LC3 and MIPS instructions at architectures, but I'm going to go through this finite state machine very quickly also. Hopefully, I will see you in person tomorrow, but probably not because uh, I'm still not feeling well and I don't want to infect anyone. Uh, so it's, not, it's going to be suboptimal, unfortunately. Thank you for your attention. And feel free to ask questions on uh, Moodle or anywhere uh, so that we can discuss. See you tomorrow.